Hi, I'm State Representative Mark Gillen, and one of our favorite events here at the office is to run a Veterans Expo. Directly across from me is our office at Flying Hills, and we're at the barn at Flying Hills. The Veterans Expo has over a dozen exhibitors. We've got everybody from World War II veterans here to Abilities in Motion, assisting veterans in a special way with the Veterans Mobile, which came up from Washington, D.C. We're going to take a few minutes and walk around the building and see what we have at the exhibitors' tables at the Veterans Expo. When George Lockery came in this morning with this motorbike, I have to admit, I've never seen anything quite like it before. George, tell us the story of this bike. Okay, well, these were, this particular one was built in uh, 1942. They built them in 42 and 43. They made a total of about 3,400 of them. They were intended for use by the special operations guys on, in the field, and they turned out to be more important for the paratroopers. They, they made a canister 15 inches in diameter that this thing fit in. They dropped them along with the uh, paratroops. So these guys would find one of these, open it up, and 11 seconds later, they'd be on their way. Can I interject a question here? Is this primarily in the European theater that oh, we yes. saw this deployed? It's, it's English, but you know, it was used in uh, in, in a number of key battles. Some of the pictures here describe those, uh, Normandy and some other things. So I'm a paratrooper, and I'm dropping out of my plane, and I'm jumping on a fully gas scooter. How far is this gonna get me? Well, it does 30 miles an hour, and it can go almost 100 miles with the gas. Um, meanwhile, the Germans are shooting at you with MG42s and MP40s and that stuff, so you're gonna get on this thing and drive. I think I'd be more inclined for the belly, but at any rate, they were pretty popular. Um, Did it take the Germans by surprise that you actually had that kind of mobility with a motorbike? I don't know the answer to that. I suspect it did. Uh-huh, I suspect so. Shortly later, they came up with the glider concept, the British gliders. They could hold all kinds of guys and uh, sort of... Um, took away the need for this, but it was, it was, uh, it was used pretty heavily. All right, does this thing run? Because we're gonna take it out in the parking lot here if it does. Uh, no, the, en <laughs> the engine I think will run. I just got finished m almost all. I don't have the clutch on yet, but um, the engine's rebuilt. I, I was able to get uh, uh, the wherewithal to get that together. How did you obtain it? And I'm gonna guess that there's that, not that many of these left. I've never seen one before myself. No. Um, Back in the later 40s, the uh, British company sold these to a New York department store. Gimbel's, I think, rings a bell. Uh, people in the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, what am I thinking of, the uh, gr groups that would go around, and a lot of them clowns, they, they bought these, painted them some absurd color, and uh, used them. Fellow in California had this one, and uh, I bought it from him. He has several, and uh, I was lucky, I think, to get it. And, uh, but it was missing a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Well, you've wonderfully put it back together again. Yeah, well, Moving on, oh, yeah. you got something here you want to tell us a little bit more about. I'll tell you about the Sten. Now, the Sten is a British design. All these things that I'm going to talk about are British designs. 
This is the submachine gun that was very popular with the, uh, with the uh, British troops. And uh, of course the Germans had MP40s which kind of prompted the English to come up with machine gun, submachine guns. What the British were doing prior to the design of this was buying Thompsons from us. But then when we got into the war in 41, uh, the Thompsons were needed by our guys, so they had a crash program to design a, a, uh, a workable um, uh, submachine guns. And this has proven to be very good. There was like 17 million of these made by all, all companies. This is a, uh, a Lee Enfield rifle designed in the late 1800s and uh, chosen by the British as their standard service rifle. And it served up and through, I think it was 57. Um, these were used by uh, other countries and it was, uh, you know, very... Let me, let me get a feel of the weight of this. I got the impression it was pretty stout. It's very stable, it's, not much kick. Uh, no, it uses the 303 British round, which Cl is like a... Clips 5. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and uh, it was very popular, but I thought it would be interesting to have a little British thing here. So these three items were really important in the British uh, World War II um, angle. You've certainly added a lot to the expo. Thanks for being here, and we hope to have you back again. Okay. We appreciate it. I'm with Doug and Liz Graybill, two great friends, two veterans, Two folks that have a passion for veterans' issues. Doug, veterans making a difference. Where did the passion come from to start this organization? And tell us something about it. Well, uh, when I came back from Vietnam and Beirut, Lebanon, I had a lot of problems. And um, it's, we all think there's no one out there to help us. And uh, six years ago, I started making deliveries to uh, widows of veterans, and I kind of liked it. And realize there's a lot of need out there, so I'm doing uh, whatever I can to help veterans of, of all ages, and uh, it's very rewarding, and I get other lonely veterans involved also, and it's helping them out. Just briefly, I know it's difficult to talk about. You came back from Vietnam and Beirut. Where were you in life at that point when you were back stateside? What needs did you have? Well, um, I was homeless about five times, and uh, I was in a lot of trouble. Uh, I would actually ask the police to shoot me. Uh, I hated everyone, hated myself, hated my life, and uh, I tell everyone that Liz saved my life. Uh, I wanted to be with her, so I changed, and uh, uh, I'm hap happier now than I ever have been. I know that's deeply personal. You came back you struggled, you see other veterans coming back, and they're going through some of the same struggles. How did this organization assist them with those challenges? Well, when we have an event, uh, say we're giving out Kaufman chicken dinners, uh, uh, I get the, the vets that are coming in for assistance, I get them to help me uh, set up the table, uh, hand out the personal care items, uh, the food, so I get them involved, and uh, I take them out, uh, deliver lunches out to the camps, and uh, it just they're helping me, and I'm helping them. It's a wonderful organization. Liz, listening to this guy over here, it sounds like he was a project when he came back. I'm not sure what it was like for you when you first met him. Can you describe those moments? Uh, Doug and I are totally different. When I met Doug, he had long hair. He was a sole parent. He had custody of all his children. He was burned out and depressed when I met him. So I changed his life by making him more positive, getting him involved in church, getting him to live beyond himself and start helping others. And Liz, right now, you're doing that work on a larger scale because you work for the County of Berks in the Veterans Office. Tell us a little bit about your story. You've got a military background, too. I was in the Army 23 years and I retired. I served in Desert Storm six months, Bosnia twice for a year each, and Iraq twice for a year each. So I have 
four and a half years deployments, five deployments, so. Well, this is a special relationship. This is a commitment, and obviously it's encouraged a lot of other people to see not only what you're doing, but where you've come from. And as veterans are coming back from overseas now, how are the challenges different, perhaps from your era and Doug's era of active service to some of the more contemporary conflicts like Afghanistan? Um, like Doug would tell you, when he's spending time with these young veterans, the stories are the same. It's just different years, different branch of service, different location, but it's all the same. We all go through the same thing, the PTSD, the combat, whatever. It's the same, coming back, trying to adjust. It's just a different time. My dad was a World War II veteran, and I think he suffered some of the very same challenges that I've heard in this conversation and discussion. There seems like there was less of an openness during that era to discuss what you were going through. Veterans today, are they opening up a little bit more than veterans of yesteryear? Um, back then, they didn't want to call it PTSD, so a lot of people didn't know how to handle it. They didn't open up and talk about it. And no, things are not changed. Veterans still don't want to open up and talk about it. They don't want to get involved in veteran organizations. They just want to be left alone after combat. So no, it's the same. Reading in Berks County is our backyard. It's our community. It's not something that we see on a regular basis, homelessness. Can you tell us something about veterans' homelessness in our own community, either Doug or Liz? There's a, approximately 50 to 60 sheltered homeless uh, veterans in Berks County. Uh, there's uh, quite a few hundred couch surfers, and uh, a lot of families and individuals we help are at risk of being homeless. There's a, a, a couple uh, truly homeless veterans that are in camps, and they just don't want, our, want any help. They want to be, they want to do their thing. They, some of the people just don't want to follow rules. You say that some people actually want to be out in, in a camp, but I also think of some of the winters that we've had recently, five degrees, zero degrees, below zero, it almost sounds like their lives are at risk. Well, there were uh, approximately 20 people that spent uh, this past winter outside. Uh, we made sure they had a, uh, blankets, tents, tarps, um, whatever supplies they needed. Uh, we'll and we made sure they had food. Uh, some of the veterans and other homeless can go into shelters. They have code blue. When it's really cold, they can go in. Some choose not to go in. They want to remain homeless. Well, as we conclude here, I sure hope that some of those homeless veterans show up here because we've got some coffee and donuts and fixings that were donated by local uh, area businesses. Is there any final thoughts that you have on veterans making a difference? Where does this go five, ten years from now? This needs always going to exist in the community. The problem's not going away. No. Uh, right now we're really working on uh, trying to establish a, a Veterans Day Center uh, in Center City, uh, open five days a week, six days a week. Uh, eight hours, 10 hours a day, a place for all veterans, homeless and at risk of being homeless, disabled vets, a, a just a veteran friendly place to come hang out, socialize, uh, companionship with other veterans. Uh, we all speak the same language and uh, it's what Berks County and Reading needs. Thanks, Doug. Liz, closing comments, veterans making a difference. Where does this go from here? And how long does this organization endure? There'll always be a need. I was going to say Veterans Making a Difference has been around about five or six years. We just became a nonprofit last year, so we're not going anywhere. And there's always going to be veterans to help, so we're going to grow and grow. We have grown in the last six years, so we're going to continue to make a difference in the veterans' lives. I'm privileged to have with me today Captain Concar, and he's going to tell us something about the vehicle behind us and why it's here today, Captain Concar. Sir, it's great to be here. I'm glad uh, we were invited. We're actually on, here on behalf of Veterans Making a Difference. It's a local community organization that um, raises awareness about veterans and also helps, helps out a lot of homeless veterans. So uh, today we have our LMTV here. It's our uh, tactical vehicle that we're actually loading up supplies in to give to homeless veterans here in the Reading area. 
if we were not loading supplies up today for homeless veterans, which is a very noble task, appreciate you doing it, what would this vehicle be doing in a combat zone? In a combat zone, this vehicle would act as a supply truck. It would uh, move logistics across the battlefield and, uh, and help out our soldiers. Um, our main mission is to move uh, palletized load, which is basically a uh, cargo container truck that moves cargo around uh, the battle space as well. Let's suppose the bad guys were interested in getting rid of this thing. What can it hold up to in terms of armament and sturdiness? Uh, it's basically a supply truck, but it is up armored, so it, it, it will take some rounds without, uh, without any hesitation, but um, this is basically a supply truck. Yeah, so. We don't want to give any trade secrets away, right, so, but yeah, yeah. The, the, the goal is to keep this out of the battlefield from what I'm gathering. You're going to move stuff to the front, but then sure. you're going to get away from that situation. Absolutely. That's the plan. Tell us your story. How long have you been in the military? You're a captain now. Where did you come from? Um, I'm actually, I was uh, born in Pennsylvania. I've been in the military for 14 years. I came in as an enlisted soldier, as we talked about earlier, as a private, and uh, switched over to officer. And uh, yeah, now I'm the commander of the unit here in uh, Reading. So. And you're commanding how many men and women underneath? Uh, we have 205 soldiers right now. So uh, we're, we're pretty full up. And uh, yeah, it's a blessing. It's a, it's a great job. And I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Take us inside what a commanding officer does. So, you know, we have this picture in our mind. We hear the word commander. You're out in front. Troops are marching behind you. Let's talk training. We're, uh, we're responsible for a lot. The morale, we're, we're responsible for the training and, and preparing soldiers to, uh, to deploy in the needs of, of the United States and the United States Army. Um, so if we get called upon, we need to be ready. And my job is to ensure that we are ready. You've been deployed yourself? I have. I've been to Iraq in 2003 uh, to 2004. You're married? I am. And actually, my wife is uh, representing Burke's Counseling Center uh, in, in there. She's a, she's a mental health therapist, and she puts up with a lot because we move every uh, two years or so, so. All right. We're looking at this vehicle here. It looks like it's got good capacity. Yep. Uh, our goal is to fill it with supplies for who? It's uh, for veterans making a difference. Um, we've teamed up with them. They, they hold a mini stand down actually in Redding at the park. And um, they, they raise uh, food, um, they get uh, clothing donations, and then they give it out to the homeless veterans. And, and every uh, month they have it um, on the second Saturday every month. And it, it's, you know, they're a great organization and, and we're just proud to team up with them. Earlier I spoke with the Graybills, I guess Doug, Doug Graybill Doug. figures prominently in this organization? He does. He, he and Liz are, are instrumental to, to a lot of the veterans in this area that, that need help, that, that, need, uh, that, that need their help, and they're, they're out there every day trying to help veterans. So, Someday you're going to get out of the military. What do you envision yourself doing? I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I, I, love, I love the military. I'm going to stay in as long as I can, and maybe, uh, maybe when it's all over, I'd, I'd like to teach at a university, I think. That would be a good job for me. you imagining teaching at a university but you're really a teacher and a mentor where you're at right now we've got a lot of young men and young women that are under your command who have needs direction Absolutely. instruction how much of a father figure sometimes do you take on to these young people well I think I think all the leaders um, we're all leaders we say that from from a private all the way up to myself to the captain so we try to we try to um, lead by example and um, do the best we can. So, I think I think everyone holds that role to some extent. And um, a lot of the a lot of the time, um, or, um, organizations like this and, and and events like this really speak to the help that the community here in Reading gives to the soldiers, and we appreciate that a lot. But I think everyone takes upon that that mentorship role. We're inside of a military vehicle, and this vehicle. Mr. Ortiz is driving here, so he's going to give us some details on its capacity. So it's the nomenclature for this vehicle is a M1078. It's a it's a LMTV, which is a light medium tactical vehicle. Usually you load for cargo transport, um, troop movements. It's a you can carry soldiers in the back of it. Uh, it's a very agile vehicle. Whether you're either in the desert terrain. Uh, woodland, even on the cross country or highway. Uh, with some of the added features on it, it has a, a CTIS, which is a central, central tire inflation system. And basically what it does is uh, you can adjust the amount of PSI that's within your tires to adjust to whatever terrain your vehicle is operating in. If you're operating in a, 
in a desert environment, you're dealing with a lot of sand. You can ch change your tires to sand mode, and what it does is it deflates your tires. So you have an, an increase, uh, uh, increased footprint and better control while you're maneuvering through desert environment. It also is a, has run flats. So a lot of new consumer vehicles have them, but they're really expensive. And basically, if the tires go flat, it has an inner inner tire that's completely rubberized so that your tire can continue to run even though you have a flat. I own a deuce and a half and I see some similarities. Could you give us the pros and cons of the uh, the deuce and a half versus this vehicle? What year was this vehicle manufactured? My deuce and a half is from 1973. I could tell you when it was made based on the data plate. Now this is an up armored version so this is more designed for the overseas assignments when you're in theater operations so it's got thicker steel for um, to prevent armor um, bullets and rounds and um, RPGs from entering, it should it has a uh, um, the newer versions of these the different models also will have a V shape underneath to prevent for IED blasts. Uh, compared to the Deuce and a half, I don't know much about the old the old version Deuce and a halfs, but this has a pretty much a push button push button driver capabilities where you can just pretty much go from neutral drive to reverse just by pushing your buttons right here. We don't have the, I guess the deuce and a half has a shifter? Yes. Yes, we, we don't have a shifter. Uh, most of the new modern vehicles are pretty much user friendly. Everything is a push of a button or a, that's it. Now, I think with the deuce and a half, it doesn't, it has kind of like a bulldog front end. Yes. Right? So this one has the front flat end, the front, um, has the front, front end. Um, the cab can also, so with the deuce and a half, you have a hood access, right? To do all your yes. maintenance. On this one, you'd actually have to dismount the vehicle and the cab is hydraulically lifted up if you wanted to work on the engine. We're in the mobile vet center with Mike Bolts. He's going to tell us something about how this works, what's inside of this vehicle, where it goes, where it's based out of. Mike. Well, this we're sitting in the Mobile Vet Center, and what the Mobile Vet Center is is part of the overall Vet Center program. <clears throat> what the Vet Center program does is offers readjustment counseling services to um, veterans who have deployed to war zones, survivors of military sexual trauma, um, as well as service members who were mortuary affairs specialist or provided direct emergent medical care to the casualties of war. So the mobile vet center piece of that pie is to help offer services where the hard, the hard standing um, vet centers aren't located. So we could bring out the mobile vet center to some of the more rural areas, a little bit more geographically dispersed veterans to offer those counseling services um, out of the vet center. Well, first of all, Mike, thanks for being here. Greatly appreciated. How long have you been doing it, and how long have we had mobile vet centers? Sure. Um, the vet center program has been around since 1979. Um, I've been working at the vet center since 2007, and the mobile vet center program has been around since about 2010. And whose idea was this in terms of getting out where people actually live versus waiting for them to come to you? Uh, well, the, so the idea that where the Vet Center program was born out of was to do just that, to be in the communities where the veterans are. And the Mobile Vet Center program um, came through just as an extension of that, understanding that not all veterans live right next to hospitals, not right next to, you know, even community-based centers, um, that they live all the corners of the of the United States. So one of our chief uh, officers decided that you know we're going to why don't we start making this available to the people that are out there um, to really meet them, you know where where they're at both, you know geographically but also you know emotionally and and mentally. You've got some electronics in this vehicle. You've got some capacity to conference, and where exactly do we connect to? And how does that work when you're conferencing? 
Sure. So at, on the mobile vet centers, we have um, internet capabilities. Uh, so if the veteran comes on board and they are an established client for counseling services, um, we can look up their electronic medical record or their electronic, um, uh, you know, kind of counseling record. And we also have uh, VTEL capabilities so that if a veteran comes on board and needs to speak to either their counselor who's not here on the mobile vet center or um, in situations where we may be the only telehealth capability, they could, if they had an appointment with their provider, um, you know, either at like a VA medical facility or the, the clinic, something like that, we could call them and they would have, you know, an appointment right here on this um, side of the mobile vet center with their, with their doctor. I'm imagining that you have veterans from every air of service, World War II right up to the present. Is that true? You're seeing yep. veterans from every different period. We are. And usually the, the needs of the veterans change over time. Um, but we, at, you know, at, with the Vet Center program, that's who we, we're here to help with a successful readjustment to civilian life. That means different things to different people at different times. So we've seen people that are World War II veterans that are coming in for the first time that really want to get connected to VA services, to the Iraq and Afghanistan veteran coming in that really it needs a little bit more you know, direction and is dealing with some of those uh, issues that arise from their military service. I've never really asked this question before, but it just occurs to me. Somebody who deploys and they had challenges stateside before they left, I'm gathering they're exasperated through the stresses of military deployment, being away from home and the familiar. And when they show back up stateside, um, we see some of the enhanced stresses in their lifestyle. You're, you're ex exactly right. I, there's, you know, the military is made up of people, people. So when they have stressors in life and then if once you're deployed, there's a, an added amount of stressors that happen there just from being separate, separated from others, um, but then also things that arise because of actually being in combat. And when you come home, and that can be compounded. And it, sometimes it can feel um, that there's really nowhere else to go or nobody understands. So when we help, make, help our veterans make that readjustment, it's not just from military to civilian and then that's it. It's, there's a lot of things that you have to kind of work on to make sure that these, that these veterans get some of those services and maybe get a little bit more direction and guidance from stuff that stems back before service, but was made worse or extra challenges uh, came around because of military service. I trust you've enjoyed our 2015 Veterans Expo. And right in front of me, as uh, we close out this segment, is some of my personal memorabilia. And if I could just point one out, my grandmother uh, was working for the Heinz Company, and this particular poster showcased Josephine Gillen, my grandmother's son, my dad actually, and she was working at a plant and he was out in the Navy in the machine gun turret of a torpedo plane in the South Pacific. Uh, we had a little area in our office that we weren't fully utilizing and I began to put some of my personal mementos there, some of my dad's air medals, and we uh, gathered some things at the World War II weekend, some old newspapers and helmets and things of that nature to decorate the office. And at some point in time, my desire is to have a veterans museum uh, right here in Berks County. So we're very pleased that you took the time to visit with us. I'm State Representative Mark Gillen at the 2015 Expo. And if there's any veterans related issues or state related matters of any type, we'd encourage you to contact our office and that contact information will be in the screen to follow.